Welcome to the Mile High Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Daniel Knowles, coming to you from Boulder, Colorado. And uh, I want to remind you before we go further, first of all, in terms of these podcasts, you can hear them on iTunes. You can find them on Facebook, YouTube, Stitcher, Libsyn. They are worldwide, heard in multiple countries. If you Go to one of those channels, for example, iTunes. Please subscribe and please share your feedback. And also, mark your calendar in permanent ink for Mile High 4, and that's August 18th to 21st in Colorado. You want to be there. It's going to be outstanding. And today we are with with one of my favorite chiropractors who's going to be a guest speaker at Mile High yet again, and you're going to learn a lot today on this podcast Dr. Jay Kamarik, welcome to the Mile High Podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Glad to be here with my, my, my Colorado chiropractic brother. Yeah. And, uh, neighbor, just, neighbor, too. And neighbor, right. Yeah. Uh, we, have, we, have to, you know, we live so close to each other, but we have to get on video or teleconference to see each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're, we're, we're both fleet of foot. We move, man. <laughs> so now um, – Let's let me just catch up with people because you just shared a great story. So before we dive into the con the, the content, last night you had a very special evening. You got to see the boss. I got to see the boss. My my favorite performer of all time. And you know I grew up for a part of my life in Jersey, so the boss was it. And, and just um, to, to clarify for people, we're not talking about Liam Schubel. No, no, the boss. That's the, that's well, that's the real boss. And then there's another another boss. There's a chiropractic boss, Liam, and then there's the music boss, uh, Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about the night. Uh, you know, it's great. Sherry, um, I was supposed to go do horses in California, and uh, she tells me last week, uh, you can't go. I've got something planned for Thursday night. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I wasn't all that pleased. I was like, we had been to Spain. We had, I, had an, I had a nice birthday celebration, but she's got this extra little thing that she's doing, and I figured – Okay, just take a breath, reschedule the horses. And um, so she tells me we're going to uh, Lafayette. I said, what could possibly be in Lafayette? Long story short, there's a great restaurant there called The Post. We both like going. I go, and I figure, okay, we're going to have a nice dinner, another birthday dinner. And I walk in, and my daughter is there with my right arm of 14 years, uh, Helene Lenahan, who was my assistant here for many years. And so I figured, oh, this is wonderful. So I get the menu, and the menu is all Bruce Springsteen items. Like it's, um, you know, uh, corn in the USA, corn fritters served with blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, this is amazing. It's so clever. (laughs) And there's like eight or nine Bruce Springsteen songs that have been converted into uh, menu items. And not only that, but they're blaring Bruce Springsteen music. I'm like, this is freaking great. So anyway, I'm, I'm totally thrilled. And so we start talking about Bruce Springsteen, and I'm like, he is my all-time best performer. And Sherry looks at me, well, she goes, well, great. We're going to go see the Bruce Springsteen concert. So right after dinner, we drove to the Pepsi Center, and I had no idea, which made leaving the horses, the 50 horses behind great, you know. And <laughs> I, uh, I was so thrilled. We, anyway, we had a wonderful night. And my daughter and best friend were there with me, so well, it was good. Know, it's, it's those magical moments that, you know, make our lives, so, and they're really important. And um, I, that's awesome. I, I saw yeah, I yeah. saw Springsteen years ago in New York, but I was a youngin then. So, <laughs> well, you know, he's amazing. He's sixty six years old. He's under chiropractic care with a good friend of mine, and he, his whole family, and uh, a three hour twenty minute performance without a break, just nonstop. Really attest to his level of fitness. And if you ever hear him speak, he's very awake and very conscious. And um, very mindful of his body and, and his nervous system. That's that's outstanding. And most peak people are under chiropractic care in different areas. So yeah. now let's talk about your background for people to get to know you. Tell us about your background. You have a you have a chiropractic family. So share with our audience a little bit about uh, your how many family members are in chiropractic and, and your background in that. You know, a lot of family members, uh, the number varies depending on whether you're including former husbands who were, who were married. So I think it's somewhere around 15 uh, chiropractors. My father and, 
you know, so I grew up in this amazing environment of chiropractic. And it was not just the philosophy, it was this incredible enthusiasm that I witnessed as a kid of my dad and his brothers discussing patients and uh, care and this, uh, you know, I didn't quite get it other than I knew that, wow, they're on fire about something. So at my table, there was we had a big farm table and my mom was a wonderful cook. We always had discussion of, around chiropractic and from the time I can remember, six five, six, seven years old, it was, um, that was, you know, our life centered around chiropractic philosophy. And, and what do you, what do you remember about like your dad's office at that, at that time? Well, you know, my dad's office was like a long bowling alley with five rooms. And back then they used to gown patients. So the men were stripped down to their shorts on a, he had Zenith Hilos in all of the rooms and, uh, they would just say, take room one, take room two, take room three. And he just went back and forth all day long. And as a kid, I, I remembered a couple things. I always remember people coming out um, of my either my dad or my uncle's office, and they're like, I love your father. I love your uncle. And so there was this uh, relationship thing that was happening between him and the people he's taking care of. And, um, and also then them, you know, talking about the fact that, Wow, I came in with such and such, and now I'm better. And um, so, you know, I grew up thinking, wow, this is like amazing, you know. And mm -hmm. I saw the occasional dog or cat come in to get adjusted. I didn't see horses until I was about eight uh -huh. to get, it, get cleared out. So that's how I got kind of my leanings toward the animal. And this was in Texas, or was this back in New Jersey? Uh, this was uh, my father uh, moved from Texas with my family to Pennsylvania to be near his brother. Okay, got it. So my brother was, they were 16 miles apart. And what was in between was U.S. Steel. And so they had 11,000 employees. And so my, both of them took care of a lot of steel workers and their families. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And, and just uh, also while we're on a little bit of chiropractic history, like what do you remember? Uh, did they do education? Did they do classes? Like well, what do you remember about that? I remember uh, 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 Reggie, you know, so okay. that Reggie was a big part of our life and Jim Sikafoos was a big part of our life. And, you know, at eight or nine years old, being taken 12 years old to go hear one of these speakers, it was so compelling. Uh -huh. You know, it was this, uh, it, you know, it's, it's the tone of someone's voice. It's their energy field. And it was the content, but I wasn't grasping the content as much as I was, like, whatever they have, I want. Uh -huh. I was a kid. You know, you saw Jim Sigafoos back then raging across the, uh, the stage. He was, you know, quite a performer. And, <laughs> and, 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 but uh, Reggie was different. Sig, I meant, Jim Sigafoos. Reggie was um, more informative, you know, nice. where I was really grasping, like, oh, gosh, this makes so much sense to me. Right. So right. my mother, I think Reggie, she had an album way back in the late 60s or early 70s called The Golden Years and uh -huh. something like, I forget the name of the album, but my mother would play that over and over again. So everything centered around our life and chiropractic, and it was just impregnated into me, you know, as a kid. Right. And my five sisters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then you get immersed, and then that's your, that's your, your vision. Um Looking, looking at that, now let's fast forward into now. You're known for um, taking care of animals. Um, and, and that, there are, my impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, is there's not as many chiropractors focused on that as there once was, um, unfortunately. Is that true or not true? That, that's true. That, um, there are people, a lot of people go to do the certification to actually master a, like a chiropractic correction for a horse. It takes many years and a lot of, a lot of practice doing that. Uh, so people take the certification program. They're out there. There aren't the kind of work I do as far as structural correction with a horse. There's not many people doing that. So there's a, I'm going to be talking about this at the upcoming Berkshires that there's a huge opportunity for chiropractors who want to do just solely dogs or horses or an animal practice. Right. And, good. Good. Yeah. Good. And now talk about, because talk about your experience of how working with horses or animals 
Um, from my impression is whenever I see that and I see a change in an animal, it so much deepens my certainty, confidence, belief, values of how powerful chiropractic is. Well, yeah, without question. I have to say that the number one um – uh, the thing that's most meaningful to me is that one that the animal does not know how to lie. So there, there's uh, the interaction is I'm going to deliver a correction to a subluxation, and then there's going to be a response, whatever that response is. So over the years, you're watching this. I was I've been watching this very pure experience of stimulus response, correction response, and then these responses then are. Um, you know, we characterize them, the vet characterizes, I characterize as better motion, better behavior, energetic balance, normal tone, normal respiration. So, you know, this wide-reaching effect that occurs, um, and very hard to dispute that. And a veterinarian who watches it or an owner who watches it is watching something. I'm not talking to them about subluxation or a central nervous system that's jacked. I'm just interacting with the animal. People also realize in watching animal care that there's a relationship. And it's one of the things that, you know, we tend to be very clinically minded and technically minded. And But with the horse, in order to deliver a horse to a, a force, to a 1,200-pound animal, you have got to have a relationship. Right. And this energetic thing that occurs between me and the horse is the opening. It's the It's the key to the opening and then allows me to deliver a force into the system and then innate takes that force and does this beautiful thing um, with it so right you know and, and that's actually very beautiful for people to think of when they're working with people you know that there's a relationship and that there's a dynamic there's not not there's more to that you know right than, than the technical application. We, we have to, you know, we have to keep that in mind because if you have it in your consciousness, and it happens a lot of, with a lot of people that's below the radar or they're not, they're just naturally want to relate to people. But when you do it consciously, you really engage this resonance. Mm -hmm. Like what you're saying is that the resonance and the connection is primary to the introduction of a correction. And right. so that if you go with the intent of I'm going to have a beautiful relationship, a kind, loving relationship, as if they were a family member. I'm seeing every person as my mother, brother, sister, uncle, you know, this deep family type thing. It, it, for me, uh, you know, I'm sure there may be some studies there, but for me it's the, it's the setting for a great care. Right. And, and, and that's an important thing as a practitioner, that people, people will focus on their procedures and what their staff's doing and what their financial plan is, and the script that they memorize, and not that those things aren't have some value or importance. Um, and, those, and it's good to have all your ducks in a row, but then if they come into your office, not with that, hey, I'm going to treat this person like I truly care about them, and, and yeah. they're, they're a family member, and that their lives depend on, on me, um, right. if they can't bring that to their presence, all that other stuff's for not. It's, you hit the nail on the head. It's probably one of the most meaning, if there was a practice tip, which <laughs> I, I don't like that, but if there was a practice recommendation, that's it. It's the, um, you know, you think, think about your best friend. Think about your wife. Think about your children and how you relate when you see them, this natural love that comes forth. That's a very hard thing to quantify. It's non-empirical like you know like well there's no way for us to to quantify that so you, but think about it and think about that's how I'm going to approach each person mm -hmm. and it's done with a, a genuine heart and then that's magic happens then you know I, I'll share this there's a quote that um, my dad Donald Donald Ipson's been saying for the last couple last year or two I've heard him say and I think it, it's exactly what you're saying and I never heard this one before in, 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 he, he said it a lot the last couple of years. He said, if you want to have mastery, okay, with care, fall out of love with your technique, fall out of love with your procedure, fall out of love with chiropractic, and fall in love with the person who's in front of you. 
that you're I, taking. I, I, I totally agree with that. And uh, I don't know that he would agree with this particular statement, but I always call it that love is the primary wave. That right. we, The primary wave between you and I now is I love you as my friend and my comrade, and right. we have this love. And then on top of that, we then do our procedure and our technique and whatever you're going to do financially – but it all begins with this primary wave of love and caring that mm-hmm. I genuinely care. I want to help people. Money is the byproduct of that. And right. I, I love, I love making, it's nice to make a bundle of dough. I love that, but it's not my primary focus. My primary right. focus is to care for you as an individual, somebody who may be suffering, somebody who needs a better life. And I have something that I do that allows for that, which is a chiropractic adjustment for the correction of a distortion and the, the field, the nervous system, the, yeah. you know, the mechanics. One of my, one of my greatest practice mentors, you may know him, Dr. John Madeira. Um, he said to me, taught me this lesson is exactly what you're saying. He said, your greatest marketing tool is your heart. You know, your, your heart, they, if they can feel your heart when you're speaking, when you're table side, when you're going over your films, whatever it might be, that that was the number one thing. Yeah, you know, when you think about it, really, when you think about what authentic means, right? if I'm, I'm talking and I'm up in my head with some narrative that I've developed or someone gave to me, some script, you're removed from the authentic moment right. to moment. And it takes a lot of courage to show up and just show up with your heart. You already have an intellect about what you're doing, but let the moment arise unto itself to let the conversation develop as opposed to trying to imprint or impose some manufactured story. People are on to that. They can, you can smell that it's contrived. And people, right. uh, pe- people are, my, my experience is people don't care for it, and they can sense it. So and, when you're authentic. Yeah. And unfortunately, chiropractic, has, you know, chiropractic gurus have told us to all do that. You know? <laughs> really, it's, uh, it's like a salesman. It's like you're a slick salesman. And I... Uh, I, I run from that, and when I see people doing it, it's a, it's a, it's a function of their level of time and practice, and also them being authentic with themselves. That I don't want to, I don't want to schmooze anybody. I don't want to juke anybody. I, I want to have a real, live to goodness, authentic relationship. And I have to say that in order to do a horse or a dog, that's the only way that works. Right. You're not giving. You're not giving a, you know, a talk to the dog, so you have to show up, and um, that's really it's primary. It's the you don't have primary. a script that you use with the horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I make them come to my talk, my health talk every week. Yeah, trailers load up outside. They unload the horses, come in. Yeah, and and I yeah. really feel that for chiropractic, being authentic. Is is the most important thing today, um, and and the profession has to somehow find its way to being authentic. Um, I think I think you hit the, I I think you just hit something there. The authentic. Yeah. I think you need to go ahead and do a little something around that. I mean, it's so true. It's so. You, you would think that people would just naturally know this, but they don't. And I think partly is the fact that they really don't know themselves well enough that they have a fear of who they are as an individual. They maybe don't grasp chiropractic at its depth right. and how broad and rich the principle, the philosophy, the science is. And so they're a little uncertain. And so they feel like, well, I've got to go ahead and take this script and I'm going to go ahead and use this. But it's got to come from truth and your real life experience and your natural voice to communicate. Right. 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 Now, let me ask you this. If people want to learn more about working with animals, what are some resources that helped you? Were there classes that helped you? Were there books? What were resources that helped you? Uh, I'll be discussing this in um, large part at the Mile High. At my talk will be there on this and also at um, the Berkshires. But at Mile High, we'll be focusing on wh- how do you go get an education? How do you practice in the state of Colorado or wherever you are? What organizations? And there are several schools uh, that you have to have 220 hours, 210 hours, and you have to be certified by two organizations, the International Veterinary Chiropractic Association and the American Veterinary Chiropractic Association, 
either one of those will test you, you get certified, and then each law, ha each state has different laws, depending, they kind of govern how you work in the state, and then <coughs> you can go to a website that teaches you that. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Um, now, in chiropractic philosophy, growing up in chiropractic, I would assume you know you had family members or mentors like your dad. But what what were some of your big mentors in chiropractic? Um, well, I'll, I'll begin with the beginning. It was um, Jim Parker? Uh -huh. uh, this was way back in the late seventies. It was Sid Williams, Jim Sigafoos, Reggie Gold. Those were my like four foundational pieces. Um, then in the late 80s, it was your stepfather, your father. Um, it was Donnie, which really fundamentally changed my perception of the field of energy that we were working with, where I was more biomechanically minded and a little mechanistic. And then all of a sudden, I realized what it meant to be holding a pattern. And not just at the atlas or the axis, but energetically, you could be holding a field or a pattern. And I, um, my, my life did a 180 after I went to my first network out at LaGuardia, uh, Sheraton or whatever it was. Right. And, uh, uh, and it was a life changing experience and also being cleared out by him. I had a, a life changing experience. I know he doesn't like to use the term cleared out, but you know, I was freed up by something he did to me that rid me of something that I had carried my whole life from one, one, a correction. And um, so I uh, owe a great deal of debt to your Donnie. And, um, and then, you know, over, after that, there was a point where I was taking seminar, 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 and I realized this has got to come from you. And I needed to then turn it inward to find my own heart, my own passion. And then I, I deepened my study that I realized I'm going to study in such a way that if I study physics, I want to be able to teach it. If I study metabolics, I want to be able to teach it. But it all, all had to come back to the subluxation. Right. So everything I studied wove back, whether I was adjusting a horse or a dog or I, love, I happen to love, you know, uh, orthopedics. So I, I always like, how does that relate to the subluxation? How does this relate to the subluxation? And I kept weaving the story for myself so that when I taught, if someone, somebody wanted to talk about neurology, I could do it. If they wanted to talk about chemistry, I could do it. And uh, I always had a deep passion for education, and um, I, I think that's the heart of good, solid chiropractic, not only our philosophy, but that you're well-versed in all the basic sciences. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this, because you mentioned one of his names. We've talked about Reggie and Sigafoos. What, in the early days, what was it like at a program with Jim Parker? Um, you know, Jim Parker had a little drawing where he um, he had this drawing, and he had these fundamental phrases. There were there, there, you were given a whole sheet, but they were spiritual slash metaphysical phrases of loving service. Right. He had LS MFT, loving service, my first technique. Now, again, he was selling paperwork for your exam, the front desk, right. and right. so he had all of that. But he realized that the requisite to great care was relational. Uh, so loving service, my first technique, um, LLL, lather, love, lavishly. You know, he had all these anac acronyms. And his big thing was educating to you that, that when they walked in the office, way below their radar was the environment of the office. Was it beautiful? Was it welcoming? Was the artwork? It wasn't clinical. He, you know, in the back room, it was clinical, but in the reception area, was it a warm, welcoming place and that it treat them like family members? So he, if you can go look at his early handout, and he had these two drawings of these two people and the conscious to conscious to communication and the unconscious to unconscious communication and that there was a trap door that would open in the individual you're working if the environment allowed for it. So if they come in and it's sterile and clinical and it's a little pushing you off, you wanted it to have the draft door open because it was an environment that said, I feel safe here. Mm -hmm. I'm in a welcoming environment. And then my communication was going to go not only into their conscious level, but into the unconscious. And you would have these very, very uh, deep, deeper relationships. And 
he did a wonderful job explaining something that we just don't touch on uh, much. Much yeah. anymore. One of my favorite uh, acronyms of his was FCB, Faith, yeah. Confidence, Belief. And my product, service, and idea. <laughs> and, my, and my PSI, FCB and my PSI, and I, I would make my staff at the time, at, you know, this was back when I was seeing 110, 20 people a day in the 80s, and they all had to memorize these. They had to memorize yeah. them, and, and at our staff meetings, we would really um, engender, what does this really mean, and how do you bring it to the table? So they weren't just things that we were reciting, but right. really a practice, a daily practice. Right, yeah. and that's one of the things I teach people. I teach my staff that... The healing starts when the person calls the office. Yeah. The healing starts when the person calls the office by how the staff communicates them. That they have just as much to play, part to play at that moment that the universe shifts for that person that they're making a phone call to reach out to change their life in the direction of chiropractic that they have a part to play in healing with that, that person at that point. Yeah, it's everything. It's everything. It's the, it's the, that's the relationship. Right. From the moment the phone picks up that they have a loving attitude and that it's not abrupt, it's not quick, like i got to hurry you along because i got somebody at the front desk, that you're really present. You know, I, I'd have to say that of all the – well, Jim Parker taught PTC of that you had asked, like, what was the – it was him and the fundamental principle that I learned, and I had brass plaques put on all the rooms. I had a little heart made, and I had a brass plaque that said PTC, which stood for – present time consciousness. And so when I walked into a room, I would touch the heart, mean get my out of my head and into my heart, and two, be present. I wasn't thinking about going home to my family or playing tennis or whatever I was doing. It was like, I'm here, it's you and me right now. That's all that's happening. Right. You and I are on this conversation. And when I was in the room, not a thing mattered other than the relationship with them. They got all of me, all of me. It was, uh, there was not part of me that was compartmentalized somewhere else. So that's, it was Jim Parker that really embedded that in my consciousness. It was the single most important thing to a successful, you know, large practice. It was that, I would say that's the number one thing. Present time consciousness. And, and you see that it's interesting thing is that today with mobile technology, Facebook, so on, chiropractors really struggle with that because they're doing chatting in between patients. You know? Distracted. Yeah, they're really distracted. distracted. And I have to train my staff to not do that because it's not culturally it, – the whole culture is distracted. You know, but when I was trained as a chiropractor, I was, like, I was taught, you know, if there's no one in the office, you're doing air toggles. You're rolling the NCM in the air, you know, because you're just you know, being in the state like the office is full even if there's no one there, right? That's true. That's really true. I, we had, you weren't allowed to use the phone in my office, so you, you could use the phone for an emergency but you couldn't use your uh, cell phone in, right. in, in right. the later years. We didn't have it in the 80s. But right. I had, when they walked in the front door, I would make all of the staff and the staff, staff members, uh, that I used to say, this is a threshold. This doorway is a threshold. And when you walk from your world, you're now in our world as caregivers in chiropractic. And that these are two different worlds. But in here, this is a healing environment. And I need your total attention. You actually get paid for showing up in presence. The fact that you can fill out a form or write a receipt or collect some dough is way secondary to the relationship. And that was my, I drove that home with everybody. Very good, yep. very good. So actually this is spurring up something I wanna ask is <clears throat> rituals. What are some rituals maybe that you did or currently do that you think will help practitioners you know, be their best? Uh, well, uh, PTC, uh, so present time consciousness, but the, the ritual, that's one thing to say it. It's another thing to practice it. People have a very, very busy mind, right? Our left side of our brain is so upregulated and defensiveness that you need a technique or a, uh, for me, it's meditation. I'd have to say that as far as my daily practice, uh, meditation daily, twice a day of, you know, at five in the morning that I'm dropping in and I, you know, I've had a meditation technique my whole career. And uh, so, you know, whether it's you go run five miles or whether you work out or whether you go sit in a sauna, but that you have something where it's you with you and you with connecting with your deepest essence and quieting your mind. People have an enormous, you know this, 
enormous amount of mind chatter mm -hmm. that really interferes with them listening to this subtle, uh, still voice, this very subtle voice that's inside. That when you're busy up top, it's very, very difficult to hear. So you have to have something that quiets your mind where you drop in and that you learn to listen. And for me, that was meditation. So I'd, my, my ritual that was consistent, no matter what my technique was doing or what I was studying, was always meditation as my primary grounding. And then from there, I began my day and always began with prayer. Thank, Thank you. you. You know, I was always very, very grateful. So. Okay, great. And, and, you know, that is something that um, most people don't do anymore. They, they roll out of bed, run into the office, and they're not in state, you know. You have to be in yeah. the state to take care of people. Um, what, have, what have been some of the greatest philosophical resources you would recommend to people, whether it be video or book or audio, to, to grow? Well, you know, I, I think uh, this is so primary, but it's, you have to speak it because people just don't do it. You have to read Stevenson's text, and you have to read it from beginning to end ten times. And you have to go and you have to study each – whether it's freshman, sophomore, junior, or senior, you have to really understand what was being said there. That when you, when you take a look at it now, as I take a look at it now and I go back, I'd say that, uh, you know, it's the bigness of the fellow within uh, Didi's, uh, the original textbook. All those are wonderful, but Stevenson's right now is still so, it was so forward thinking. It was so amazingly forward thinking as to what they were already thinking about then that we still apply today and uh, very little of that needs to be changed. So I, I would say that you have to master Stevenson's text textbook. Um, Dee Dee's textbook was pretty amazing. I, um, you know, those early textbooks and you know, it's hard to get through the green books. I mean, but uh, there is so much content there. It was so amazing. Like how comprehensive they were yeah. in their thinking. And then, you know, the, uh, the other thing, too, this fundamental law of uh, – it's a law of physics, which is the um, – uh, uh, it's the law of least action, mm -hmm. meaning I'm going to do the minimum and get the maximum result. So to wind up here at the Atlas axis or a contact that you take in this low minimal force or whether it's a, a direct adjustment, that you're going to do this introduction of force mm -hmm. to get this maximum change that we were already on this. It's a pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 I, I agree. And you know, um, one of the books I just discovered, and I know you and I talked about this cause he's a hero of yours. Um, drain, uh, yeah. the book that Simon sends on just republished, yeah. um, from him from the same year that Stevenson's wrote. Incredible book. Yeah. Pretty, pretty incredible. Again, there's so many, uh, that particular book, uh, the book that, uh, it was Dr. Drain that uh, really introduced, um, uh, he wrote Anything Can Cause Anything, which was William Harper. Right. And again, I think Simon said it maybe uh, two or three weeks ago. It's, the, it's like one of the most famous unread books that yeah. when you read it, you're like, oh my gosh, here's a guy who had this incredible almost engineering mind who was able to, to bridge the gap between these philosophical tenets right. and this physiology. and. Right. Uh, and wrote a neurology textbook too, he, you know, uh, William Harper. But Drain was his, you know, they were they were contemporaries and they worked together. They started uh, Texas Chiropractic College back, I guess that was in the 40s. Yeah, uh, maybe I'm not. I don't know the year, but I. No, oh, I, I, it was long before then that they did TCC because that book was 1927. So, but uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Drain's book. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. So. Um, uh, what now? You've been involved with Mile High. You've been. We've had three events. You're going into our fourth year. You've spoken at two of them. This will be your third. What? And you've been in. How long have you been in Colorado? I've been here since '99. Okay. So yeah. let me ask you this: um, What have <coughs> you? Uh, what have you noticed about? chiropractic in Colorado since we've done Mile High? More deeply grounded. You know, we have a very, very solid foundation here in the state now that's reached out to those people that may have been on the fringe of chiropractic, not really embracing what we're really up to, that all of a sudden realize, wow, we have a presence here. 
and I mean, you have wonder all these amazing chiropractors now who've deepened their understanding of chiropractic through Mile High. They go back into their communities and then tell the chiropractor who may be on the fringe or doesn't really grasp the the importance of what we're up to. So I uh, we've really um, not only for Colorado but all of our surrounding states. You know, we have things on the East Coast and on the West Coast, but to have something right now in the central states. It's uh, really just we've we've done an amazing job, Danny. It's you know the undertaking, both you and Rochelle, it's huge. And so anyway, I'm very very grateful. And and what I've noticed is that is that this area of the country, I always thought well, in chiropractic history was very um, rich in chiropractic philosophy and technique. You think Gonstead, Toughness, Palmer's obviously. Um, yeah. You know, Midwest some people can. Spear Chiropractic Hospital, you know. Spear, Spears. I mean, this was a big hub of chiropractic enthusiasm, yeah. and it becomes so devoid of that and becoming allopathic. Um, and it's really great because I'm really seeing in the, in the Facebook groups and the Mile High groups and people things that there's a there are big rising up of very focused, vitalistic, subluxation oriented practitioners, and it's great because you saw that in the Northeast years ago. And in the southeast, you know, um, in, 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 in Parker, Texas, right? So it's good to see that rise up here. It's, it's, well, it's wonderful. And, you know, it, the, the public deserves this. And, you know, we're doing a better job. Like we have great resources. We have, you know, we have these incredible programs that are philosophically based. You have your program, the Mile High program, which is so rock solid. You have the Berkshires coming up. We have great um, mentors now throughout the profession that are steering students in the right direction to get good footing, to have good practice management so that they financially can thrive. And then, you know, once they're thriving, they're able to go give back to the profession in a way that really for, uh, deepens our philosophy, deepens our fr uh, foundation. It's huge. And, you know, again, we, we, we floundered there for many, many years through the through through the 80s and through the 90s, we had a 20-year kind of a dead dead spot of there was nothing was connecting. Nobody was connecting the dots to this fundamental principle of universal intelligence, subluxation, interference, distortion of the neural network. And now you know we've got that in a, a really big way. And now we just keep moving forward. You know, you we just keep moving forward to keep deepening the philosophy, and in a strong way, not just in a um, not just in the philosophy, but when we've got the science, like the science is out the wazoo in, in neurology and in chemistry that totally supports what we're up to. And now, so that it's not like we're just saying it, but we've got the, the backing, you know, you've right. got the data, you've got the evidence. And now if, if you don't know that, it's just because you haven't done your homework. Right. And um, the chiropractor doesn't know that and say, we don't have the evidence or we don't, that's baloney. They just haven't, they just haven't studied. So the moment, they open their mouth. I, I can tell whether they've really worked the clay of what we're up to. You realize, wow, they just haven't, they just yeah. haven't brought themselves up to speed. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'm really grateful because I've seen for years from you, your intention has been to raise consciousness, to raise awareness, to light candles, you know, to, to help people get focused on the, the um, core values of our, of our profession um, okay. and to keep our profession – uh, focus on what is our reason why and our reason even for existing. So I really appreciate that about you. Thank you. It's far reaching. When you think about what we do, it's so far reaching, right? It's whether it's on the physical level, the mental, emotional, metabolic level, it's so far reaching. Yeah. And, you know, and you give peace to somebody's life who's suffering. Yep. Who I, I call it legitimate suffering. When people are subluxated, the level of suffering can be really, really deep. So you're removing that level of suffering through clearing their nervous system. And I say hooking them up. We're right. hooking them up. <laughs> and, you know, our fundamental pr principle is this uh, universal intelligence. So you're hooking them up to this primal in energy that is life-giving. That's right. where the life originates. So, you know, and I have no fear about talking about that. And if I need to bridge the gap, we do it through physics. Right. We're able to have that conversation with no right. problem. So, right. Right. Well, well, thank you for, for who you've been in chiropractic, uh -huh. who you continue to be, and what you give to chiropractic. I'm very grateful to see you in a, a few days. I don't. I, I mean, I don't think this is going to be live on uh, 
iTunes until after the Berkshires event. But I'm looking forward to seeing you at the Berkshires event. All right, yeah, yeah, thanks. We'll have a good time. I'm looking yeah. forward to that. Scott, is, Scott Garber's done a great job with that. Oh, yeah, pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I look forward to seeing you at Mile High, and maybe I'll see you even in Boulder sometime. Okay, well, let's, we'll do lunch. I'm lunch, breakfast, whatever. You just holler when you're ready. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us on this podcast. Um, we really appreciate it. if you subscribe on iTunes, share your feedback, and register for Mile High, Mile High Fault for August 18th to 21st, um, www.milehighcaro.org. And let's also ask this. If people want to learn more, connect more with Jay Kamarik, how can they do that? Uh, Facebook. I'm, I'm on Facebook. You can just reach me at jkamarik at gmail.com. My number is 303-495-9190. That's my personal line. Just you just reach out. I'm uh, be happy to help anybody who's who's a little lost or struggling. Well, that's great, and, and it's great when you had think of a profession that has people that are so care about what we do that want to make themselves available to help others. You know, uh, you know when you think about what chiropractic has given us our life, our livelihood, a family, of friends and colleagues, and when you think about what chiropractic has given to us. Right. That's pretty pretty amazing. So I'm, right. I'm happy, joyful to give back. Yep. So thank you, everybody, for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this podcast. Look forward to seeing you at Mile High. Like our page on Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Mile High Cairo.